for anyone striving to get to the top of their game, this episode is for you. I'm joined by a lady who champions the human spirit and puts confidence, kindness and humanity back into her leadership programmes. It's the lovely Kim Adele Platts. We're going to be making conversations about leadership count. So, what's new, Wendy Wu? Do you remember that lady I was telling you about that was in Barcelona? She'd booked the power-up session and we caught up to see how she had been getting on. She's had a great shift in the conversions of the conversations that she's been having. And they've also implemented some operational changes based on the conversations that we had. I'm going to be really looking forward to working with them again later in the year. I've also delivered a customer service webinar to 10 champions at the British Library. It was a great afternoon and it was interactive and fun. And at the end, I was told it was better than they expected. I'll take that as a huge tick. The lovely Jo in Bromsgrove wrote in and said this. After listening to the conversation with Sarah Townsend, I've just realised I don't carry my business cards. So you made me rush to get them and put them in my handbag. I've got to figure out now how to keep them from not getting dog-eared. Well, Jo, that was a great tip. And let us know the first time you have to get one out of your handbag. From South Africa, Michelle Wolfe has left us a Podchaser review. You are all about making conversations count, Wendy. I loved the tap, tap, then slap, slap and sledgehammer story that was Anne Hobbs. This podcast is not only about how to publish a book, it deals with life and loss. Although grief connects us, somewhere and somehow it reconnects us too. Well, Wolfie, that is a true observation. And if any of the listeners know how to help Anne make her story a film, do get in touch. Time to carry on the conversation with the lovely Kim Adele Platts. The reality is that our simplest Human beings want to be listened to, they want to be understood and they want to be respected. And the other thing is, none of us want to be foolish. So if we believe that to be true, nobody wants to appear foolish. The same is true of whoever gives you an opportunity. Because if they give you an opportunity, if they thought you were going to fail, they risk appearing foolish because they gave you the opportunity. They're not going to risk appearing foolish. So if they gave it to you, it's because they believe you can do it. So borrow their belief. And it's amazing the things you get to do if you just, I borrow people's belief all the time. (laughs) Right, belief, Hoover. It's like you said, come on and do the podcast. I was like, okay, I'll believe in you that I can do this. Even I'm not sure I can, but I'll give it my best shot and I'll borrow your belief and do my best not to let you down. And it just allows you to change the the tempo, I guess. It's fascinating, isn't it? Because I had a tumultuous upbringing and by the age of seven all sorts had happened my mum and dad had split up there was a custody battle I'd switched from parent to parent I'd run away I was skipping school but at seven I knew I wanted to be either a teacher or a policewoman now that I'm older it says a lot more about who I listened to as a child and perhaps who I was most influenced by yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it makes total sense. Total sense. Because my relationship with my mum now is just a diabolical, you know, and my dad's no longer here. It's like you saying that, oh, I've got a bit of mosh here. Um, oh, but- that voice that you are to your child totally was like, my dad was like stood here going, see, that's what I've told you. You don't just say to somebody, can you go and do something? You say, I need you to do this because yeah. that will be the result of it. So not only will it help me, it will help you. I've got my eldest daughter working for me now. Oh, wow. You know, and she's gone off and she's doing all sorts of amazing things. And she's like, Mom, if it hadn't been for you, I would be wobbling so badly over 
what I'm doing in my life. She says, but I've, I've got that anchor and I know that you're in the same boat. That's what ties you down, isn't it? Is It's that connection, isn't it? It's that piece that's like, you know, you're, I think with with all the people in our lives that, you know, we're here for a reason. We're here to support each other. And you, and you look at it and say, you know, what would you say to the people that you love and care about, whether that's your, your children, whether it's your family, whether it's your closest friends? You want to be there for them, don't you? You want to be there to say, do you know what? Give it a try. Because even if you fail, what's the worst that can happen? We'll still be here. We'll mm-hmm. still we'll still love you. And yet we don't do that for ourselves, do we? We pick on the most critical voice. Do you think, though, that sometimes that's because it's not always a two-way street and it's not always equal? It's potentially a more maternal instinct than a paternal instinct that as a mom, I'm there to support my husband, my extended family, my children, people in, in my business, my clients, blah, 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 blah. And yet, how often do we actually hear, well, when are you doing so well? Or Kim, this is brilliant what you're doing and believe it. Oh, and we don't, do we? Because we have one of my friends, um, Caroline, she's great. Uh, she calls it the Primark brush off, where somebody gives you a compliment and you immediately go. So somebody might say, oh, you look really lovely today. And you go, this fiver from Primark. It's like even when we are given mine ourselves, you mm-hmm. can't accept it. Because accepting it might feel egotistical. It might feel like the person thinks that we're better than we are. And therefore we just get rid. But how would we feel if we gave that compliment to somebody else and they did the same? We we would feel a bit like, oh, (laughs) we genuinely meant it. We meant that you're doing a great job. You've got this. And we've got you back and we're so proud of you. Have you learned the tactic to reinforce the compliment? Because I know I have when people do that brush off because I... I don't pay big compliments of respect often. I'm encouraging because that's in my nature, but a big compliment. And if it's brushed off, I will make sure they know from where it comes from. I have to kind of really reinforce that to make them stop and listen. And and I want them to accept it and hold it. Yeah. And actually, sometimes I'll share with them the whole Primark brush off piece and go, I'm a a massive do as I say, don't do as I do, because I... <laughs> yeah, because we'd be in big I'm trouble if otherwise. So I'm, I'm probably still learning it. And sometimes people will say something and I have to say, thank you. And then carry on the rest of the conversation in my head, which is just a fiver. It's like, just don't say it, Kim. Just don't say it. Say thank you. Uh, and then, you know, and I'm getting better now. At, you know, actually, I really appreciate that. Yeah, or I really needed that today. Because sometimes we do really need that and we need to know that we're doing all right, that we're making good choices because life doesn't come with a manual, does it? And we do our best and we, we layer in children and families and friends and you're doing your best to try and be a value add to the people around you, that you leave everybody with a feeling of increase. And, and sometimes you you doubt that you're doing, <laughs> you, come like, you feel like I'm actually doing nothing, that, doing nothing well. And I think we're Nat and I were chatting about this on our reflections the other day. I said, yeah, we constantly look at where it is we need to go, but we don't often look back at how far we've come. And we need to do that because if not, life's just going to be very, very hard. Even if you climbed Everest, there's base camps and camps along the way because you need to be able to acknowledge how far you've come whilst getting ready for the next bit. It doesn't mean to say you stop climbing the mountain, but it means that you give yourself some kudos for having climbed as far as you've got. It has to be Everest as well, because otherwise you get to the summit and there's something else taller. Absolutely. <laughs> you get to the top and you go, and that's next. <laughs> yeah. And we do, don't we? Because we're yeah. always striving for the next thing and we don't give ourselves time. It's about balance, isn't it? Because, you know, we don't want to spend that long congratulating ourselves on how far we've come that we don't move forward any further. <laughs> so I, woohoo, look at me. Yeah, juggling it all can sometimes be that you can't actually progress at the speed of knots that you want to go at either. It's like I had a conversation with somebody who I've worked with for a number of years and I just said, look, you know, I've held myself back because I know my time will come. And the response I got was, Wendy, that is so sad. Because how do you know that you'll get your time? You're you're kind of banking on the fact that, you know, the children will be grown up and out of the way and everybody will be settled and then then you'll have more time and freedom. When will that ever really happen? And we're all guilty of it. We're all guilty of putting our lives on hold, waiting for the perfect moment, Mm. the perfect time where it's all going to just fall in. 
But the problem is... I've got Martine be- McCutcheon singing in my head now. <laughs> this is my moment. <laughs> this is my perfect... <laughs> The fact that my voice when I'm singing sounds like fingers on a blackboard, I join in. But I mean, that's just not fair to anybody listening. But it's true. We put ourselves on hold for this perfect moment, this perfect time, this perfect something. And actually, it's what I call silent delaying. And we will see it in people that you meet. You know, we'll all have had those meetings with the silent delayers that violently agree with what you're saying, but then go, just before we press go, I wonder how many people are wearing a blue jumper in a DN postcode today. And you're like, really? What value is that going to add to the actual <laughs> discussion? And it isn't. It's just a way of delaying actually pressing go. Yeah. And we do it on ourselves all of the time. We convince ourselves that we are absolutely in support of what we're doing. And then we'll create a silent delay, which is, you know, and I do it all the time, well, you know, when Scarlett starts school or when I meet somebody and therefore I'm not on my own and, and that will become a little bit easier. When we're not in lockdown and, and actually I've got some childcare, when we're not, when we're not, and you're like, you can't live your life on when, 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 when. You've got to live it right now because, you know, the, the past no longer needs us. And the present uh, the present is all we've got because the future isn't promised. So all we've got is right now. And I don't mean that from a doom and gloom point of view, but actually if we live in the moment right now and we make the best of the moment we've got with what we've got available to us, then actually before we know it, we're doing things we never thought we would be able to do. And we're doing them now. Yeah, I was talking to Nat about this and saying that there are so many opportunities that I wished I'd have took, that I've learned to recognise how that opportunity makes me feel when it arises, because I hate regret. I hate looking back and going, oh. And then Nick as well, Nick taught me about Big Magic and I was reading that book. I got so far and then I stopped because I've got this idea already And I had to go and do something with that idea before it it got lost. When it makes you just feel, oh, my God, this is so overwhelming. I can feel my chest actually cramping now and my tummy's like rolling. And I'm thinking it's it's that scared to the nth degree. I want to swear and I can't. But those are those moments where you go, I've got to do this. It doesn't matter. What yeah. happens? It always reminds me a little bit of that part in Dirty Dancing. So a uh, real movie from my childhood. In fact, the first movie I went to on my own when I was, uh, well, with my friends when I was 14. And that moment where she says that she's scared of saying this, but she's even more scared of walking away and never feeling the same way. And I just think that's a great, Kate, she was talking about that relationship, but actually it's a great way of thinking about our lives, which is actually I'm scared of doing it, but I'm more scared of walking away and regretting it in my future. Because we don't regret the chances we took. We regret the chances we didn't take. Because the chances we took always move us further forward. I say to my clients, you know, there's no downside to an interview. And you can see looking at me like, she's a crazy woman, this one. (laughs) I didn't get the job, but there was no downside, hey? I get you, I do get what you're saying. So so for me, whenever you go for an interview, there's only two outcomes. Either you get the job, in which case, fantastic. Or you get a really good feedback of what you need to do to get the job next time. Either way, you're one step closer to the job. But only if you frame it that way in your mindset. If you go, these are the only two things that are going to happen. So, you know, I'm only going to get, I'm only going to get there. And the same is true of like anything that goes wrong in our lives. You know, I, I genuinely believe that everything in life is either a lesson, a blessing or both. And it might not feel like it at the time. I mean, don't wrong, there's been plenty of moments in my life where it didn't feel like much of a blessing. <laughs> I wasn't really sure what lesson I was learning. I just felt broken. I just felt like, you know, one massively melodramatic moment. I was that broken. I didn't know how to breathe. And obviously I do know how to breathe. I'm still here breathing and still talking. And probably people wishing that I could just stop for five minutes. But at the time, that's how it felt. But now when you look back, you realise that you were learning something. You were learning that you'd got more strength of character than you thought or that you could overcome some of these things and I've also learned that people don't hurt us on purpose they're dealing with their own pain and the reality is harsh as it sounds they don't even think about you you're just it's more about them than it is Um, yeah and what happens is we layer in how we feel so we start telling them how we feel now I'm they're there dealing with their own pain unable to cope now you're hurt now you want to tell them about how you feel and they feel frustrated because they're like hold on 
this was about me and now you've made it about you and I was already in a bad place and now you're in here. And the whole thing just spirals. So, you know, much as my husband says that I'm a bit of a robot, it was like your ability to just put it in a box and move away. And I was like, when I don't, I deal with it. I just deal with it on my own because dealing with it with you or whoever it is isn't going to help because you're dealing with your own pain. So why would I add to that? Because it's not going to help. I need to find a way of dealing with my own pain, my own way. It's about breaking the cycle, isn't it? I mean, my dad was always very supportive. My mum thinks she is, but it is always about her. And it's about breaking that cycle. And we do tend to do things and copy patterns, behavioural patterns. And I can just say I've broken that pattern. And I know I've broken that pattern because of the way that I have had to do it on my own. And some some of the family just don't understand. They think I'm detached. But I think yeah. that, that has been the difference between, you know, when you were saying you run off and get these memories to measure. The negative me- memories are survival. Yeah. The positive memories are the thrive. So, you know, it's kind of like I will look at things and go, right, what's the positive of this? Because there's no point dwelling on the negative because you're never going to break the cycle. It's like somebody moaning about a particular situation over and over and over again. With me, I have a three strike rule. If you moan about it three times, that's it. I'm not going to give you my advice again. (laughs) Move on. You've got to be able to take it, haven't you? And it's like, you know, I mean, you'll know I love a good quote. And I can get a quote anywhere. anywhere. And for me, one of of the ones I use at the moment, and it's from Frozen 2, which is, Take the next right step, do the next right thing. Because sometimes we can't see, can't see the answer and we can get stuck trying to work out the answer to the big problem. But actually, if we just take, if we just look at what is the thing I can see that I can do and do it, you change your vantage point. And I think it was Michael Jordan that said, you don't need to see the whole staircase. You just need to take the next step. Because if we keep moving forward, then we change our viewpoint, we change our vantage point. But We do, unfortunately, come into conversations with people who are just stuck in that doom loop. And, you know, pity loves a party. So, you know, they want to invite people into that so that they can just dwell in it. And it's like, but that's not going to help you. And it's not going to move you forward. And actually, it's just going to drain you. And I remember one of my friends saying to me once, she's like, I can't ever decide if you're incredibly stupid or incredibly strong. I was like, probably a bit of both. (laughs) Probably in equal in equal measures, which is you know I'm a big believer in. You know, worrying doesn't change anything, but it does change you. You can't. It's not going to alter what's happening, but it is going to alter your focus. Whereas if you can just focus instead on what can I do, you know, what is the thing that I can do? And I, you know, I often describe it to people as the you know the thing that I can do becomes the life raft to cling to in the stormy scenes of my mind because mm. everything else is out of my control. And I don't like being in that stormy sea. So if I can cling wholeheartedly to one little life raft that's just moving me forward, then I stand a chance of weathering the storm. Great analogy, Kim. I mean, you've kind of are mindful of the mental health first aid training that Mm. I did, and they liken depression and negativity to a, a black hole, you know, that you're at the bottom of a well that's got no water in it. So, and, you know, they were saying about, you know, you can outstretch your hand to somebody, but if they don't want to take your hand back, then, you know, you've got to leave them where they are until they're ready. So that one step could well be that if you feel like you're stuck in a hole, in a puddle, doesn't matter the analogy. If one thing that you can do is the raft becomes a conversation with somebody that you yeah. can have a conversation to work something through. It might not change anything, but at least you've got somebody on your side. Yeah. And actually sometimes saying it out loud, you know, we have, we can have these conversations in our head, but until you have the conversation out loud, until the words come out of your mouth, and hopefully this resonates with people, we'll all have done it. And sometimes we say it and we're like, ignore me. I understand for myself how ridiculous that is now, now that I've said yeah. it out I loud. I sound like a complete and utter crazy woman. <laughs> Head, that made total tangible sense for days yeah. when I thought about it. And it's like, you know, I do quite a lot of stuff on imposter syndrome. And one of the biggest challenges with imposter syndrome is you won't tell anybody you've got it because your biggest fear is being found out. So if I tell anybody, I'm bound to be found out as I'm telling them. We know all the research says that if you can share it, it's the first step to overcoming it. And we get that fear. So, so I remember I share this a, a quite a lot. 
I did a keynote speech before we went into the first lockdown. And I remember standing there and looking, I never look at the audience, I looked at the audience, all the things they tell you not to do. And I panicked. There was like standing room only. There was all these faces looking back at me. And I was like, you don't need to do that. Get off. And I remember looking at this group and, and saying to them, do you know, every fibre of my body is telling me to get off this stage and run as fast as I can. And I can't for a couple of reasons. The first, I don't think I could run fast in these heels. And the second is I'll never come back from it. My name and my face, my picture is plastered all over this programme. So you will always know that Kim Adele Platz is the girl that ran away. So I can't do that. But I can give myself permission to share with you it's how I'm feeling And in doing so, hope I can shut the little voice up long enough to remember what I'm here to talk to you about. And then I got on with the rest of the speech. So I thought to myself, what's the worst that can happen? I share that with people and they could all walk away. They could all go, if she doesn't think she should be here, I'm not going to give her my time. It would have been embarrassing, but I wouldn't have died. You know, I'd have been a bit mortified. I've had to go and get myself probably a very, very stiff coffee. People actually respect that kind of open, honest admission because they know themselves that it's unlikely that they would ever want to put themselves in a position of being on the stage either. So you saying that means that you've immediately connected with everybody. Yeah. And actually I had people queuing at the end to come up and say, you stood there in a bright red dress with bright red lipstick and a massive smile on your face, looking like nothing's ever bothered you. And yet when you said it, we knew you meant it. And we were like, well, if she can do that, maybe I can do the whatever it is I'm fearful of. And I said, to be fair, that's my reason for sharing, because we're all fearful of something. We all have something we're vulnerable about. I spent years terrified that people were going to find out I was just an ex-hairdresser and turn around and go, oh, my God, we put the hairdresser on the board. That's awkward. Get her off. I didn't, honestly did not know that. I mean, I know we met through the Love Ladies mm-hmm. Networking online. We've had the opportunity of meeting in person, but it's never quite happened. I don't know why. My impression of you online is your quotes are always positive. You're all, it always adds value. You're like that kind of auntie it, to, to me that kind of goes, come on, if I can do it, you can. And I don't know whether I'm going to do it, but I'm giving it my best shot. That's your the impression that you give out. You know, It's incredible that you've just shared that you were a hairdresser. I wouldn't see that. What was what is wrong with that? I love my hairdresser. Oh, I I don't know. I love my hairdresser too. Absolutely. She, you know, she she's a dream. And actually, for years, I was worried that I was next hairdresser because cutting my teeth in corporate life, you'd get put on all these future leaders courses where they'd get the application form. So you'd be put forward based on what you did, and then you'd have to fill an application form, and they'd suck they'd suck their teeth, and they'd like look at it and they'd go, "Ah, where's your degree? I don't have one." Where's your A-levels? Well, I don't have those either. So actually, over the years, I started to think, oh, my goodness, I shouldn't be here. I'm even more of a fraud than I thought I should be because I don't have the qualifications. I don't have the education. I don't have. I got told at one point I didn't have the gravitas and I didn't have the vocabulary. So I had to learn a new vocabulary and work on my presence. And, and all of those layered into my own lack of faith that I was actually good enough, that I was worthy. And I now realised being a hairdresser wasn't my downfall. It was my superpower. Because as a hairdresser, they teach you to really listen to people, to understand what's important to them, to create a level playing field and a connection, and then to communicate effectively and to watch them walk out as the best version of themselves. That's leadership. Because as a leader, if I can listen to my people, if I can really understand them, and if I can help them be the best version of themselves, then I've done my job as a leader. But that pulls back on my skills as a hairdresser so once I realized that which I'm ashamed to say was probably about four years ago I'm 48 this year so I mean I'm I'm definitely a late learner (laughs) but once I realized it it was like actually I've spent years running away from the thing that made me good at what I do yeah you're a beautiful bloom now it's everybody's journey is everybody's journey and I do believe that we go through things at the point of readiness and come to, sometimes we do have to push ourselves through certain barriers and boundaries and vulnerabilities and because it's all based in emotion, isn't it? But I can hear what you're saying about the qualifications thing, because I bunked school most of my primary, secondary, managed to come out with qualifications. I don't know how. So there must be a, a level of education. But a couple of years ago, I thought... How am I? How can I say that I have done this for 30 years and that I have all this experience, blah, 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 blah. 
and whilst I've done the job and I've trained and I've managed and recruited, how can I actually say this on, on CV because I've got no qualifications? And I went and put myself through getting a degree. <laughs> and, you're like, yeah. and I didn't have to. Yeah, but we do, don't we? I mean, I became the worst course junkie. So if you read my CV, I didn't have the degree and I didn't have any of those things. So I panicked. So I'm a lean to practitioner. I'm a prince practitioner. I've got diplomas and, and qualifications in uh, leadership. I, when I became a coach, I didn't want to be another fraud in my head. So I went and got my level seven diploma. I then became a Marshall Goldsmith accredited coach. I'm not doing it for anybody else. I'm doing it for me. I'm doing it for me to be able to say, I can credibly say I can do this because not only have I got 30 years experience doing it with great accolades from people saying the impact I had, I've got a piece of paper. I mean, how ridiculous is that? So I've got 30 years experience, just like you. People coming out of the woodwork saying, you know, this woman really made a difference or really helped me to believe in myself. Or, you know, I had, I had some lovely things recently it would really blow you away where you didn't expect it. So somebody had put out on, on LinkedIn, does anybody know of any good speakers that, that can like inspire and motivate people to kind of go and do more? And I had two people that I'd worked with in the past simultaneously put me forward for it. People that I'd led years ago, and I was totally and utterly blown away. Even if I hadn't have got the gig, just the fact that they were willing to say, you want to speak to this woman. She's genuine. She's authentic. And actually she's walked that walk. And I was like, oh my goodness, that how humbling that somebody could be that kind to you. And I think sometimes we've got to take those moments. And, and rather than I spent so many years dismissing them and going, oh, you know, they're just being kind or they don't really mean it or it isn't this or it isn't that until I realized I was inadvertently disrespecting them. I was inadvertently taking their opinion and their beautiful gift of giving me their, their feedback. And almost like I now imagine when somebody gives me feedback, I imagine the most beautiful and delicate glass bauble and go treat it like that. Because if, if you immediately go, oh, yeah, no, you're just being kind. It's like you've just let go of it and smashed it to smithereens on the floor. You wouldn't do that with a gift. And feedback is, is a gift because people have to give of themselves. They have to put themselves in that space of... It can be uncomfortable, can't it? It can be a little bit because we're we're terribly British. We don't really like to step out there and and we've and been kind conditioned, of, haven't we? And yet we all strive for unconditional love. So absolutely. there's an oxymoron in in how we try to live our really? lives. Oh, totally, <laughs> totally. Yeah, you know, I'm desperately trying with my little girl to make sure she knows that the love's unconditional. So even if you know, even if she's being told off about something, it's like, this is about what you're doing, not about who you are. So mummy always loves you. No matter what happens, even if we fall out, mummy always loves you. Yeah. We're talking about what it is that we need to do differently. And they're not the same thing. It's not a score and, sheet of life, is it? You know, it's, it's not ticks and balances. It's about the whole. And, and it took me a lot of years to realise that we are perfectly imperfect. Mm. Because I spent years desperately trying to be everybody's cup of tea. We're British. We could argue about how we take how take our tea as much as we could about politics and religion. You are never, ever going to be everybody's cup of tea. And then I found a quote, which was, I'd rather be somebody's shot of whiskey than everybody's cup of tea. And I was like, I love it. For the right people, I'm their shot of whiskey. And for everybody else, I'm not their cup of tea and that's fine. I would never knowingly hurt or offend or upset anybody. And if I ever did, I would apologise because it isn't my intention to ever do that. It doesn't mean to say I won't do it, but it won't be intentional. But therefore, you know, if I'm not their cup of tea. They can move on. And that doesn't mean that I'm being unkind. It just means it can't be everybody's cup of tea. We are perfectly imperfect. And it's okay to have a difference of opinion. It's okay to disagree. We just can't disrespect because we live in a world of polarity. So for every up, there's a down. For every left, there's a right. So I always say to my clients, you know, if I were to hold this book up and say to you, Wendy, there's literally nothing written on the cover of it, would you say I'm right or I'm wrong? I'd say I see it differently to you. Yeah. But when I turn it round, there's nothing written on my cover. And actually, once you realise that just because I'm right doesn't make you wrong, and just because you're right doesn't make me wrong, we're just viewing it from a different, different viewpoint. Place. Yeah. And that's life. Everything we do, we're viewing it from a different viewpoint. And if we change our mindset to seek to understand always it doesn't mean to say we have to agree but we constantly seek to understand then all we can ever do is grow and you know my nan always said every day is a school day and god bless her she was right because 
if we open our minds, we learn something every day. And what an amazing gift every morning to go, I wonder what I'm going to learn today. I wonder what new thing or experience or opportunity or challenge, any of those things. I wonder what, what today is going to bring because I'm going to grow from it. And you, you talked about we have to go through our things. And I'm a big believer that we grow through our pain only if we go through our pain. So we actually have to look at it and look at the, and we can't always do it straight away. You know, there's been things in my life that that it took me years before I was ready to actually go and visit them and look at them and say, what were you teaching me? <laughs> what did I need to learn from this? Because I wasn't ready for the lesson. So I survived, but I didn't thrive. And to thrive, I had to go back into those dark spaces and really look at them and forgive myself for not being there for myself and for, for not being perfect, for not being there for everybody else, but take the learns. And, and I think it's that it's how we do that and, and kind of move forward. And uh, yeah, you were so kind, bless you, with the, you know, I come across as one of the aunties that's going, if I can do this, you could do this. I think that's my, we all have a purpose in life. And you know, Pablo Picasso said that the meaning of life was to find your gift and the purpose of life was to give it away. I believe my purpose is to say, do you know what, if I can do this as a slightly scatty, not particularly well educated, has been through, you know, a number of disasters. I mean, I'm nearly finished writing my book, which is called You Couldn't Make This Up, Three Divorces, A Stalker and An Evil in a Critic. It's like, actually, my reason for it is, you know, if I can traverse this world with all of these things, so can anybody. But all you've got to do is, is find the right people to believe in you. And when you doubt yourself, borrow their belief, but then do the right thing and pay it forward. So if you've borrowed somebody else's belief, lend your belief to somebody else, because that's going to be how we change the world. That's going to be how we move it forward by sharing our belief in others and borrowing other people's belief in us when we need it is going to be, I believe, the new currency, that and kindness. Now, everybody that I invite onto the show, I ask them to think of a conversation that created a turning point for them, simply because I think that those stories resonate with each of us and we can take a little bit from every story that we hear. And it's those memory banks that I want people to be building up to go, do you know I'm in this situation and what do I do? And the memory banks go, well, you remember when you listened to Kim on Wendy's show? You need this bit of advice now. What was that conversation about, Kim? It's been so many over the years, but I think for me, probably my biggest turning point was becoming a mum. And it was talking to people about, you know, I was terrified becoming a mum. I was in my early to mid 40s. I was 43 and I'd had a miscarriage and I was you know, later on in life and I went and gathered as much information. I was terrified I was going to get it wrong, that I wasn't going to be right. And, and then I spoke to one of my friends who said, do you know what? You've just got to go with your gut. You've got a good heart. And as long as you're always trying to do the right thing, and you're willing to acknowledge and take account when you get it wrong. Be as kind to yourself as you can be to other people. It was a real turning point for me because I've always had the reputation of being kind and kind to everybody else. I've been evil to myself. And in that moment, I suddenly realized that unless I learned to be kind to myself too, I wasn't going to be a good mum because my little girl is going to learn from me. She's going to learn not just what I say and do, but what I say and do about myself, how I behave, how I show up in the world. I knew I needed to make that change. And my friend also told me about this writing down every day, anybody that you've touched. And by that, what I mean is if somebody says thank you to you, or I appreciate that, or that really helped me, whatever it is, write it down. Because then when you have those moments where you've got it wrong, absolutely, you have to acknowledge it, you have to apologize for it, and you have to make it right. But that's it. You don't then have to carry it You know, I used to wear it like a hair shirt for the rest of my life. You know, yeah, I do joke that this is why I've had so many divorces. It's like, you know, when you kind of end up in that argument and you're like, and another thing, you never emptied the dishwasher in 2004. And like, really? You're not over that yet? You left the toothpaste just with the lid off and you didn't straighten the towel. Come on, Julia Roberts time. Yeah, and you're bringing it up 10 years later and you're like, really, really? But I did that to myself. I carried every mistake and every new mistake would just get added to the previous mistake. That's a heavy load because we don't make mistakes because we're trying to get things wrong. 
We make mistakes because we're trying to do the right thing, but we're perfectly imperfect. And actually, if you can just forgive yourself in the same way that you forgive others. So we forgive others when they make mistakes because they're human and we all do. But I think we've got to learn to forgive ourselves. And for me, that was such a massive turning point. And I'm still not brilliant at it. I still sometimes get it wrong. Um, But I will go back and I'll look at that little book. And then I wrote a quote for my little girl. But on reflection, I believe it to be true of everybody in the world. Uh, And that is to be kind, to be curious, to dream big and believe, because we are proof that miracles happen. Because we're all proof that miracles happen to somebody. And maybe that's just the thing we need to hear, that we're a miracle to somebody. Oh, You've got a good friend there that's given sound, sound advice. And I would just sort of say that when it comes to not always getting it right, that's going to happen because we've got to unpick stuff. It takes a long time to break a habit, much the same as it is to give up smoking or to cut down on your drinking or to not put as much in here so that it's on your hips. And, you know, there are so many challenges that we have to face that you're not going to be able to lead the perfect life and and act in the perfect way. So, yeah, just be. Yeah, I think it is. It's not being kind to yourself because I'm a big believer. And this is for anybody. You know, I, I don't believe people have negative intentions. There'll be an exception. Because whenever I say that, somebody will bring up a serial killer or something. And it's like, OK, there's an exception to every rule. However, in the main, I believe people have positive intent. That doesn't mean to say they'll always have a positive impact. No, you know, we all know when we're giving feedback to people that you know, one of the things that you know, I've spent years doing senior leadership roles and you have to give people feedback. And the first thing they do is defend what they were trying to do because they weren't trying to get it wrong. They were trying to do the right thing. They just didn't quite manage it. So now I don't even start with the feedback. I start with what I think you're trying to achieve is I think what you were trying to do is X, Y, Z. Am I right? Is that what you were looking for? And they're like, yeah, yeah, brilliant. That's exactly what I want you to do. What I need to talk to you about is whilst that's what you're trying to do, and that's an amazing goal, this is what's happening. So how can I now help you to align what you're doing with what you're wanting to do? Mm. And how can I help you to achieve it? You've immediately ensured that they don't think you think they're stupid. You don't think that they are trying to do a bad job. And you're now their ally in achieving their goal. So you're now in it together rather than on the attack. And it makes the whole conversation so much easier because you're dealing with intention versus their impact. And it makes difficult conversations so much smoother. And I think once we get into that place, that is, you know, if somebody's doing something, even if it's really obvious, you know, I go into organisations, I often do transformational stuff as an interim. And the first thing I say to any organisation, any team is, if I do something that's really irritating, even if it's really, really obvious, could you do me a favour? Could you just tell me what it is? Because even if it's obvious to you, I promise it's not obvious to me (laughs) and I'm not intending to irritate. So unless you tell me, I'll carry on doing it because we have blind spots for a reason. We're blind to them. That's why we have coaches because they can shine a light. We all have blind spots for a reason. We're blind to them. And actually what we need is people to shine a light on our blind spot and say, you know, here, this is where you get in your own way. This isn't saying, you know, you're a bad person or you know, you're trying to get things wrong. It's around saying you might not know this yet, but when you do this, actually, it's not you at your best. Or sometimes our blind spot can we, we're really good at something, we just can't see it. Um, And so, you know, the amount of people over the years that have been working on something that they're darn good at, they're brilliant at it. And when you chat to them, they're like, yeah, I'm working on this. Don't, you're brilliant at it. Work on this, where you're not quite so quite so good. And then together you'll level up. But I think we've just got to be more open, haven't we? Yeah, that, I think that's where conversation really does count, doesn't it? In terms of picking who you have those conversations with, like who you pick as a coach and for what reason, whether it be personal, business, growth at work, whatever it is, it, it really does come down to, to who it is that you're having those conversations with. It's got to be, and I talk to all potential clients and say, you know, I won't be the right coach for everybody. You know, the first conversation has got to be around whether or not you think you can trust me. Because if you can't trust me with your worst fear, we won't be able to get you to your full potential. Mm. We'll get you to as far as you're going to be able to share with me. But if you're going, I can't share this, then actually it's not the right thing for you. 
And likewise, I look at those conversations and go, do I think this person's going to share? Because if they're not going to share, I don't want to waste their time or my time. You know, I want to be able to help people to get out of their own way and go on and be the best that they can be. People make quick assumptions and they make decisions very, very quickly. In your line of work, when it comes to starting that conversation, how long do you think it takes before they've made their mind up whether they're going to or not? It's a fascinating question. So I believe they've probably made that decision in the first five minutes maximum. It can take them a while to acknowledge that decision. And I always say to them, go with, go with your gut. Right? Yeah. It can, you know, we, we don't trust our gut enough. Our gut instinct is usually there to keep us safe. And then we overthink it and we come up with reasons why actually maybe it's wrong. I said, but for me, I've always said, trust your gut instinct. Gut instinct is basically your inner child and your soul telling you where it thinks. And that's the bit you're trying to connect with. That's the bit you're trying to understand. Where is it damaged? Where does it need help? And know that there's no right or wrong answer. The right answer for you is the right answer. So you don't have to justify it to anybody else. And I guess for me, that's why I always set it up with clients that go, I won't be right for everybody. I'm saying that so you've got a really easy get out of jail. But likewise, I want to be able to add value. I want to be able to leave things better than I found them. And if someone's not going to be able to trust me, then yes, I can leave it a little bit better than I found it. But that's not really going to leave them with a feeling of increase. And and I think that's what we're all here to do is to leave everybody and everything better than we found it and acknowledge that we can't be that for everybody. And that's okay. Kim, I think if all the other bits of pieces that we've talked about, which are really helpful and insightful, there's one thing that I know that people really do struggle over is if they need a coach or not, who should they pick and why should they pick them? And you know what? Five minutes and trusting your gut is probably the best advice they'll ever get. Thank Thank you. you for that. If people want to get in touch with you, you know, it's always to carry the conversation on, listen to the show, leave a review. But really, we want people to be getting in touch with the guests and carrying that conversation on, whether it's just about sharing the experiences, whether it's that you'd like to talk to Kim about being a client or or whatever it is. What's the best way for them to get in touch with you, Kim? All over social media is Kim Adele 10. I'm on LinkedIn as Kim Adele Platts. Or if you went to my website, which is www.kimadel.org, my telephone number, my email address is there. And I'm happy to chat to anybody. Sometimes all we need is a conversation. And, and for me, it's always a non-obligatory conversation. Sometimes you just need two minutes and you'll work out for yourself. It's not it is or it's not for you or actually all you needed was just that two minutes. I'm sure you will agree that that was a powerful conversation. We all need to keep a check on those blind spots. Kim has kindly offered a free downloadable document that we will put into the show notes on Apple. We'll also be putting them on the website and Kim has very kindly done a letter to listeners Find out what she's offering to you and go to all the W's making conversations count.com website for all the details. Now, of course, you're welcome to book a chinwag with me. You'll find all the details on the website too. My book is a bestseller and it's currently on special offer for the Kindle version. Until next week, where we'll be bringing Marina Hoa talking about branding. Thanks for listening. You know, we all need to be herd animals. And at the same time, we have this very innate sense that we need to be individuals. (laughs) 